So very warm welcome indeed to all of you for a Terence Terry Riley lecture tonight, which is a second lecture in a series of architectural mediators. And if one is, as uh, Terry is, the Philip Johnson chief curator of architecture and design at the Museum of Modern Art New York, then obviously his job description is to mediate. And uh, uh, the invitation to him uh, was uh, obviously not only because he's been uh, uh, previously with us with Berlache, but actually because of the extraordinary job which he put in last uh, 12 years, being a curator and uh, being a practicing architect as well, and uh, being a, actually a curator of many architectural shows, being a member of the jury, and being one who was actually shaping pretty much the development of the museum in terms of uh, uh, it's a new appearance, uh, uh, actually the new edition or extension of the MoMA was opened recently. So somebody uh, which um, fits obviously ideally almost into the profile of the mediators as we announce them for the lecture series here at the Berlache. So once again, Terry, thank you very much for coming here. It's a pleasure for us. And uh, we are looking forward to your lecture and uh, obviously a debate because these lecture series are pretty much about debating uh, the, the issues. Uh, you are obviously starting with Victor Hugo, I think. Uh, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's going to be a pleasure to listen to you and to debate with you after the lecture. Once again, welcome to the Bella. And most of the time when I'm giving lectures, it's, it's usually talking about, well, it's usually more mediation. I'm usually talking about exhibitions I'm doing and using the lectures as a way of either testing ideas or, or, or expanding on them. And, uh, but the, the topic of, the, of the, this lecture tonight, Architecture in the Media, um, is uh, an attempt to step out of that a little bit and, um, and, and look at uh, the subject of architecture and, and media from a certain distance uh, to maybe shed some light on uh, broader issues. Um, that said, I, I have to say that my interest in this topic is related to some of the shows that I've done, and I think it's actually a kind of subset of the exhibition like construction or the unprivate house. Um, now, this idea of somehow getting an objective view of the media is, is uh, especially today in this kind of unbelievably media-saturated uh, culture that we live in, I think is somewhat like uh, asking a fish to, to describe water. What is water or what is, uh, what is this? Ask a fish to describe a river. Uh, it's, it's such an all-encompassing uh, sort of total, uh, totalizing uh, phenomenon that the idea of getting away from it or stepping back from it seems almost impossible. So um, what this lecture is tonight is necessarily broader and shall we say um, skimming along the surface uh, with the intention that if you get far enough back you actually might maybe say uh, like in terms of a river you might not plumb all the depths of the river from source to the mouth but if you understand where the source is you understand the outlines of the banks and you understand where the uh, uh, where it reaches the sea, uh, you see a kind of trajectory, trajectory you see a, a pattern, you see a, a, um, a vector, and maybe that vector then becomes a way of understanding not only where we are now, but where we might be going. Um, because uh, a lot of this argument is, is rather intuitive, I asked a friend of mine, Ben Aranda, who's a media producer in New York, to create a series of graphs which uh, hopefully will add a, <coughs> a luster of uh, scientific uh, appearance to this admittedly intuitive argument. Um, this is an uh, indication, and for uh, in this instance, the, the origins of the story that I'm going to talk about tonight can be found in the Middle Ages. For my purposes, we will use the date of the completion of Notre Dame Cathedral, 1350, in Paris at a time when the distinction between architecture and the media, like that between theology and science, didn't really exist. Architecture was, in effect, 
the principal source of information about the world throughout Western Europe. Using today's terminology, architecture was the market leader. As a um, student, I took a tour of Chartres Cathedral. This is not Chartres, but it was an image I had of Rams Cathedral. Uh, and the tour guide, M Malcolm Merriweather, described Chartres Cathedral as a book, and architecture is its bindings, uh, invoking a media um, image from the very beginning. Um, the story being told through the iconography of the Gothic Cathedral embraced not only theology, but political history, folklore, and natural science. In short, the cathedrals were seen as speculum mundi, mirrors of the world. Victor Hugo's novel, Notre Dame de Paris, written in the 19th century, portrayed the medieval world, but carried with it a prediction about the vast changes that were just beginning to be made manifest in Hugo's own time. One of his characters, Frodo, says of the book and architecture, this will kill that. That is, the book will kill architecture. In the 19th century, it would have been clearly evident that the book had indeed ended architecture's monopoly on information. However, Frodo's prediction seems to reflect Hugo's own beliefs about how the changes in his own time would play out and play out in the future as well. What might be called Hugo's theorem of the media was unsurprisingly, given the spirit of the age, Darwinian. Relying on the notion of the survival of the fittest, Frodo's quote reflects the idea that new sources of information would replace old sources, just as the dinosaurs would die out and new forms of life would come uh, to inhabit the earth. I would add to this, or I would actually oppose this idea with my own theorem of the media, as it were, uh, and that is that no new, media replace, no new media replaces a previously existing one, but rather new media simply create more media. And then these pie charts, um, I told you, we're covering 16th century, so it has to go rather quickly. But um, the idea of these pie charts is to sort of illustrate that, that as time goes on, there are more and more channels of information, more and more media. And not surprisingly, uh, if you look at the sort of whitish disk at the top, um, I think it's safe to say that we intuitively know that as more and more create, uh, discrete media emerge and expand the sources and channels of information that, in fact, architecture's role is diminished. Now, in uh, Hugo's own time, 1802 to 1885, we'll consider that a period, uh, the media would have included, of course, architecture, fine arts, painting, sculpture, etc., books, encyclopedias, newspapers, journals, ballet, opera, all sorts of other secular forms of entertainment. And even, uh, it's, it's interesting to note, even in 1850, telegraphy was, was very widely used in, US, in the US and Europe. Uh, New York and Boston were connected by a telephone exchange. And of course, photography uh, and all its derivatives, stereoscopes, magazines, photojournals, et cetera. Um, now, another sort of intuitive notion, and again, another bogus um, chart, but uh, even if we accept the notion that over time there are more media and there is less role, shall we say, a diminished role for architecture, we also know that the role that architecture continues to play is actually a very high one, and that if architecture isn't necessarily called on to provide every bit of information for society, it's certainly called on to pr provide uh, some of the most important. Uh, 1850 is, of course, also the time when John Ruskin can describe architecture as, quote, the work of nations. So if uh, there's a kind of diminution, of course, there's still these major uh, important cultural messages. And these find themselves expressed in new kinds of buildings, new kinds of institutions. Here, uh, the Vienna Kunsthistorisches Museum, the notion of a museum as a uh, uh, comprehensive uh, view of the cultures of the world. Uh, the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, itself a kind of uh, amazing database of its time. Uh, the Galleria Vittorio Manuele in Milan, uh, not information, but uh, goods, material goods, all being brought to the same place and arrayed in a, a spe specific sort of orders. Uh, 
and the phenomena of exhibitions, the Crystal Palace in London. New types of architecture, new types of institution, new uh, types of speculum or speculi mundi, uh, mirrors of the world. Now, in this period, I think the most notable um, emergence of a discrete new type of uh, media is the invention of photography, which I think could be said to have created uh, a permanent alliance with architecture from its very inception. Uh, on your left is a, uh, an image of a tour book uh, from the early 19th century, once the middle classes began to partake of the grand tour. Uh, lower left image of the um, an engraving of the Arc de Triomphe, and on the right, a photograph uh, of just a few years later. Um, photography, uh, most, uh, many historians of, of photography now um, don't use the word uh, discovery to describe the emergence of photography. Uh, what they point out is that everything that was necessary to make a photograph actually had existed and was known for about two centuries, or at least 150 years. Uh, reaction of chemicals to light, uh, lenses, optical phenomena, the inversion of uh, imagery, etc., camera obscura, all of this had been known for quite a long time. Uh, these uh, uh, historians actually believe that photography wasn't so much invented as, um, or, or discovered as invented as the need for images from the Grand Tour uh, continued to expand with the expansion of the, the people who were involved in it. In other words, when it was only aristocrats, it was paintings. When the, uh, the group of people that were uh, able to take the tour expanded, it became engravings. And then as it expanded into a wider middle class, uh, the, the need for cheap and multiple images became such that uh, photography was implemented more than, shall we say, discovered. And not surprisingly, uh, the first subject of photography is architecture. Uh, for two, re well, for three reasons. One, there was a demand for images of architecture. Two, architecture conveniently didn't move, and it uh, was in daylight, so it had all the um, satisfied all the needs uh, of the time. And the um, <clears throat> What's interesting is the first anonymous photography is actually uh, photography of architecture. In the um, earliest photographs, the photographers were very conscious of what they were doing. They signed their work. Uh, we know who did most of these very, very early photographs. By the mid uh, uh, second half of the century, though, architects began hiring photographers as this new subset of of a profession, architectural photographers, and the first anonymous pictures begin to emerge. We have thousands of pictures of H.H. H. Richardson's uh, buildings uh, from the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s. We have no idea who took the pictures. They actually become a kind of anonymous uh, extension of the architect's work. Um, that said, with some digging, you are able to uh, discover these various alliances Frank Lloyd Wright working first with the photographer Furman during the um, prairie style period, and later Pedro Guerrero, a photograph here. Uh, interesting photo I saw in the hallway. Uh, Shulman making a kind of permanent alliance with Neutra, propagating images of his work all the way to the Berlaga Institute, and continuing today an image of OMA by the now ubiquitous um, firm of Esto photographers. In, um, in the late 19th century and then up into the 20th century, shall we say, to the end of uh, the beginning of the post-war period, uh, again, uh, we see the emergence of uh, new, uh, discrete types of uh, channeling information. Uh, we see a, a growth in terms of what you might call the overall uh, uh, concatenation of media, and we see or intuit that uh, architecture begins to play uh, yet uh, a continuing smaller role. Um, just as photography was incredibly important in the previous period we looked at in terms of its relationship to photography, 
there are some new um, phenomena in this period that, that need to be noted. And um, I think we'll see that they don't actually have the same uh, friendly relationship with architecture as photography. One of which is advertising. Now advertising, that is commercial messages, have existed in the West since Roman times. There are still recorded and preserved commercial messages from Pompeii. Most of these were very small though and uh, handmade. In 1891, a, an organization called the Outdoor Advertising Association of America is formed. And the purpose of this odd sounding group is to standardize the size of billboards so that an advertising agency in Chicago or, or New York can plan an advertising campaign for the whole country because it's uh, standard sized billboards. In 1910, the first neon sign was invented and unlike some other uh, technical inventions, neon went directly into advertising. Its first application was advertising and it immediately became a feature of the early 20th century city. And then film. Uh, in the late 1890s, uh, there's an interesting competition between Thomas Edison and the Lumiere brothers uh, and that was <coughs> how to exploit this phenomena of the moving image. Thomas Edison, who was usually fairly uh, prescient about these things, actually had it all wrong. He believed that the way that film would develop is that films would be inside containers. You would put a coin in the container, you would look in a slot, and you would watch the film. The Lumiere brothers firmly believed that film would be a performance, and they, uh, their system was to travel around in a wagon with a projector, set up a tent, and charge people admission, uh, and a film would be um, presented like this lecture to an audience uh, rather than as a private experience. But uh, be that as it may, uh, I think what we're gonna see as we look at some of these slides, these new phenomena present more of a challenge to architecture, say, than uh, photography. Um, the Proliferation of commercial messages within the city was first tried to, uh, Hausman actually first tried to uh, contain these messages and control them. And this, you know, famous kiosk from Paris uh, from his tenure, um, under his rule as prefect of Paris, the only ads that could be posted in the city could be, they had to be posted on these kiosks before they could be posted. They had to have the stamp of the prefecture of Paris and you had to pay a tax. And so there's this uh, attempt to uh, control commercial messages. By the 20s and 30s, you know, the advertising is literally leaping off of these kiosks, uh, not only finding its way into all sorts of parts of the city, but beginning to approach in terms of scale and superimposition, a kind of architectural competition. Um, people, uh, the city fathers who were trying to control the growth of the city, uh, still believing in the notion of the city beautiful, believing that uh, the message of the city, the meaning of the city was something that was conveyed through urbanism and uh, uh, architecture, uh, certainly had no uh, reason to try to understand what these, the advent of these uh, commercial messages might mean in terms of the legibility of the city. Now, these commercial messages were not without their own kind of romantic modern allure. And this notion of uh, neon signs, this is Piccadilly in probably the 20s, uh, where the whole uh, cityscape is kind of overtaken with light and the architecture just uh, gently kind of disappears behind it. But this kind of staging of commercial messages was in fact a huge, uh, causing huge anxiety with the uh, city fathers as it was. And um, this project uh, is the um, Stuttgart uh, Bank competition by Mies van der Rohe. And one of the less well-known aspects of this competition was part of the brief was that the project had to incorporate advertising. The um, city fathers were uh, concerned about the sort of growth of advertising as a superimposition on architecture. And in this instance, uh, the requirement was that it had to uh, 
uh, accommodate advertising. So this was what you would call a mixed use building. The ground floor was a bank and it had clear glass so that you could view it from the street. All the uh, floors above it though were white glass, milk glass, and they were backlit. And these letters, they're like the letters on a movie, a film a cinema marquee where you could slide them back and forth in different channels and add in different sort of messages. At night, of course, they would be lit, and backlit, and the, the advertising would thus be sort of seamlessly joined with the architecture. Interestingly, uh, this project by Marcel Breuer, I'm sorry, yeah, by Marcel Breuer, um, a pre-war competition to redesign uh, Leipziger Platz in, in Berlin, um, turning it surprisingly into a huge traffic circle. But again, these buildings that bounded the circle uh, uh, were to be this white glass. And again, part of the brief was it had to accommodate advertising messages. Um, another project that incorporates advertising, probably I would say of all these attempts in the 20th century to grapple with this new media, this project by Oscar Nietzsche, the Maison de Publicité, is probably the most successful. This was to be the Paris headquarters of the Walter Thompson Advertising Agency, J. Walter Thompson in Paris on the Champs Elysees. And it was a kind of um, a meditation, if you will, on media and publicity at the time. At street level, you could walk in and there was a hall where all the newspapers of the day would be hung out and posted so that you could step in, survey the headlines, etc. If you chose to, you could go further in and there was a walk-in theater where you would, there was no seating, it was a kind of oval shape. You walked in and they played uh, newsreels. The idea was to play newsreels 24 hours a day. So just as people kind of dip into their computers and log on to various uh, sites to familiarize themselves with what is happening, this was imagined as a, a spontaneous street level media outlet. Up in this level there were um, uh, uh, ateliers for the fabrication of these uh, neon signs and billboards which would be then lowered down on scaffold and attached to this lattice that was the permanent part of the facade on the Champs Elysees. That said, this kind of aspiration and that kind of talent for integrating architecture and advertising is not really the story of the 20th century. And in fact, this slide, which shows Times Square from in New York from 1912, where it is essentially you know, a recognizable urban space defined by architecture over the course of the century from 1912 to 1997, the architecture is slowly but uh, undeniably um, uh, disappearing behind the, the uh, predominance of, of images. And uh, in, indeed, I think this kind of uh, unhappy um, resolution of architecture and, and, and uh, advertising is probably much more typical of the 20th century than, uh, than otherwise. The other uh, important media uh, invention of this period, of course, is film. And uh, there, there is a film, I wish I could have brought it, but it shows the next step in that progression from etching of the Arc de Triomphe to photograph to film. And uh, of course, the film camera is not nearly as sympathetic to architecture because it, um, it doesn't move. And so all of this uh, activity that the camera is looking for is really uh, not to be found in architecture, and what happens in the Champs Elysees is that uh, the new view is taken further back so that the whole foreground is this surge of automobile traffic, and the Arc de Triomphe becomes a kind of backdrop to it. And in this set here, this is a movie set by Paul Nelson. This was the first Hollywood film set that used modern architecture in 1929. Um, as you can see, uh, there's a kind of attempt to you know, and Paul Nelson was a very strict sort of functionalist, but I think he realized that in terms of film, there actually was a problem in that the architecture didn't move. And he did this kind of very Baroque uh, film set where there's a, a kind of spinning and turning and twisting kind of architecture, uh, trying to resist the notion that uh, architecture is simply fading into the background. Uh, another film, Len Human by uh, Rene Arabs, this was a uh, 
very important early film with uh, Melly Stevens doing the sets, Chereau doing the furniture, etc. But like so many uh, films of this period, the, uh, the real uh, star is now not the architecture, but the uh, automobile. I think Le Corbusier was probably the most sensitive to this um, uh, gap between traditional architecture's photographic nature and uh, its techno-scientific basis, that is statics, and the comparable lack of an architecture that might relate to the new media, film, and its techno-scientific basis, mechanics. So uh, Le Corbusier is, of course, a tireless promoter for a new kind of architecture, and these pamphlets and posters, et cetera, are always accompanied by a barrage of images of airliners, airplanes, automobiles, ocean liners, et cetera. Uh, Stanislaus Moss, who is going to speak to you later in this series, points out, I think rather convincingly, that the thing uh, most, uh, one of the aspects of Le Corbusier's work that really harkens back to this fascination with movement in the automobile is that uh, he sees the uh, buildings being raised up on piloti akin to uh, uh, the automobile's body being a sort of chassis that's raised up on wheels, and that, that underlying this whole discussion of pilotis and floating volumes is a kind of desire to see architecture be less grounded, less founded, less uh, static in terms of how it um, touches the ground. Now, if Le Corbusier saw this in a more intellectual matter, more theoretical way. This notion of architecture trying to move is certainly not his and his alone. This is uh, actually another Schulman photograph, this spiraling uh, uh, signboard trying to uh, suggest movement to more avant-garde applications, a surprisingly anonymous uh, Russian constructivist project for a moving, transformable theater and even pop culture uh, a, a mobile bus church uh, updated uh, by Archigram in a more uh, techno uh, monumental way. Um, so, um, again, back to a dubious graphic chart. You know, if maybe we understand architecture to oh, be sliding or slipping somewhat in terms of its overall effect on terms of culture. This is a time uh, where G.K. Chesterton could still declare that architecture was the alphabet of kings. And even in this period where we might intuit that there's a kind of um, diminishment, uh, this is still the period where the, 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 the great debates about the end of the Beaux-Arts period and the rise of the Bauhaus and the international style, world's fairs, et cetera, et cetera, reconstruction after the wars, are all a a fairly public and important cultural uh, uh, struggle to define uh, and control the so-called alphabet of kings. Now, jumping forward, 16th century is really going quickly. Um, from that period, 1950 until today, uh, certainly a period uh, we all have more direct experience in. Um, now, I would say that in this period, something different happens, though. It isn't just that there have been new media emerging as discrete phenomena. Um, it's in this period that uh, architecture has to be seen as a distinctly minority practice vis-a-vis -vis not discrete new techniques, but the media, capital T, capital M, as it came to be known after the publication of Marshall McLuhan's 1964 Understanding Media, The Extensions of Man. The media, the global concatenation of Hollywood, television, advertising, newspapers, magazines, and all these other forms of communication was swiftly becoming the new alphabet of kings, with architecture cast in a decidedly minor role in the creation of McLuhan's global village. Even so, at the outset of this post-war period, architecture continues to play out its traditional role in some instances. Projects such as Brasilia, by La Costa and Niemeyer, Chandigar by Le Corbusier, uh, U.S. Embassy by Stone in New Delhi. Um, these and many other ambitious architectural visions sought to redefine a new monumentalism for a triumphantly modern, postmodern, post-war world. 
Notwithstanding, and in this instance I'm talking more about America than Europe, uh, notwithstanding these in, in achievements, Brasilia, et cetera, the real place of the media is increasingly suburban. The split level tract houses of Levittown, which was the first tract development of its kind, first suburban tract development, it should be remembered, all came furnished with television sets. They all had built in television. In this brave new world, architecture's market share, if you will, quickly plummets, plummets press best illustrated in the, media, in the media's first television architect, Wilbur Post. At the end of that last chart, I made mention of the Fountainhead, which of course glorified uh, the role of the architect as a, a maker of monuments. Uh, Mr. Wilbur Post, however, is an architect who uh, sits at a drafting board set up in a stable and talks with a horse named Mr. Ed. So a decidedly less heroic image, slight, decidedly more suburban. Now, it's hard to characterize the explosive developments in architecture in the 60s and 70s as it grappled with its role in the world of the media in brief. Reflecting this crisis, amongst other things, in 1959, SIAM, the International Congress of Modern Architecture, disbands, marking the end of one vision. Uh, a few years later, two books, Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture by Robert Venturi and Autonomous Architecture by Aldo Rossi, try to imagine a trajectory for architecture that would no longer be the work of nations, no longer the alphabet of kings. In, I'm oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. In both books, the authors sought to disengage the fate of architecture from its now decidedly minor role in the transactions of post-war material culture. Rejecting the zeitgeist was indeed a radical step and produced equally radical architectural expressions. But in retrospect, it must also be noted that the zeitgeist was for the most part ignoring, if not rejecting, architecture. Now, um, this is the header and the footer of the so-called Arts and Leisure page of the New York Times. And um, what I think is really interesting is to look at the way the Times organizes how they present the arts and leisure. Um, theater gets a heading, film gets a heading, television and radio get a heading, music, dance, and then art and architecture are actually combined as a single uh, category. Uh, and as you'll see, of course, all the way on the far right of the, uh, of the um, lineup. And it, it, if you think about it, what it's really saying is that there are all these things that are performance-based, that move, that, uh, uh, and then the, in this corner there are those old-fashioned things, uh, you know, art and architecture that kind of <coughs> sit there uh, and, and don't do anything. Unleashing architecture from its zeitgeist, essentially dropping its prior role, did produce some of the most extraordinary architecture ever produced. However, this is another topic. As an autonomous practice, it was liberating for architecture to reflect upon its own history, although few in the more radical moments of the 70s might have predicted that the embrace of history would be such a sticky affair. Uh, on one hand, producing uh, challenging and important projects like Rossi's Modena Cemetery, but on the other hand, producing projects such as the AT&T building. Now what's ironic in my mind about um, the appearance of the AT&T building and Philip Johnson on the cover of Time Magazine in 1980 was that the AT&T building was being built just as the whole landscape of telecommunications and the media were undergoing seismic shifts. Two years after the building was finished, AT&T was broken up, transforming itself from a telephone company, essentially, to a multimedia computing and telecommunication system driven by forces that would create new alphabets of kings. So in this time, really, where in a certain sense, architecture is taking a breather, architecture is seeing itself as autonomous, seeing itself as related to its own history, its theories as being uh, in, interior theories that um, need not necessarily be uh, expanded beyond the boundaries of architecture. All sorts of incredible things are happening after CIM disbands, you know, the, the first major computers were actually already built uh, for corporations and governments, UNIVAC in the early 50s. By the 70s, um, Paul Barron of the RAND Corporation was working on a problem called packet switching. And this 
solution to this notion of packet switching is what allows the emergence of the worldwide net, but the first version was called the ARPANET, and it was the US military's internal website uh, in 1969. Um, and of course, you're all familiar with the personal computer. It's hard to imagine that it was only introduced in 1981. Uh, and has come to uh, dominate um, personal as well as professional uh, life. Now what I find interesting is that after that period of, of basically some time out uh, for architecture, in the late 18, 1980s and the 1990s, you have a sudden and a very aggressively, a very aggressive move by architecture to respond to um, some of these uh, more uh, uh, radical changes in technology and how they apply to life. And I want to talk about a couple of projects that um, I see as kind of epitomizing, in a certain sense, the, the reaction, the, 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 the turn away from autonomous architecture and the, the intention to integrate architecture with the new developments in the media. These are not necessarily supposed to be the four best projects or the four that I like the most or, or but I think there are four projects that visually communicate um, what I'm trying to get at. And the first is um, Toyo Ito's uh, Media Tech in Sendai. And um, this is the most recent of all the, these, of these four projects that I'm going to show. And in some ways, as radical as this is, it's an architect doing what architects have always done to respond to cultural stimuli. I mean, he's working. Uh, not with media images, not with metaphors. Well, I shouldn't say that. I think he is using architectonic metaphors to embody a new sensibility. Um, there's an a, a unbelievable sense of lightness uh, to the structure that I think is very much part of a discourse of, of modernism in the late 20th century. And it's a lightness that is both physical and sort of metaphysical a lightness that corresponds to the, the bits and the, the fluttering uh, images of the keyboard. Uh, but in essence, um, approaching the whole idea of uh, a response to the, the contemporary culture uh, in a, a, a traditional architectural metaphorical architectonic way. Two other projects, though, that I think really step outside of traditional, or two projects that example exemplify stepping out of uh, the way architects have traditionally approached uh, exterior stimuli, if you will. Uh, one would be uh, OMA's uh, Center for, Cult for Art and Media, um, the project itself uh, foretelling its own um, uh, emphasis. And uh, this was, I think, in the late, you know, late 1980s. And of course, the, the notable feature then, as it is now, is this huge, quote unquote, media wall. It's um, important to remember in the late 1980s, this was a technological fantasy. There was no possibility of a media wall. And it's also interesting to realize that in this competition, this was not the only project uh, submitted that had a media wall. And um, this is, uh, I think, an example of a very early leap you know, in terms of trying to grab onto the media as a new um, uh, generator of architecture. In many ways, this project represents a further step in the fusion of media and architecture predicted by Mies and Nietzsche in the 1930s. Rather than mechanical superimposition or collage of elements in front of a lighted surface, however, the OMA project fuses the two. Here, the facade of the building literally becomes a screen for the projection of streams of images, combining architectural, film, and computer metaphors. ZCAM presented a new kind of speculum mundi, in a sense, for a new world, However, unlike the cathedrals, there was no fixed message but ever-changing flows of information. Like the cathedrals, however, the message was big and finally assuming an urban presence. The other project, the third uh, one I'd like to talk about is actually, in, I think, in the end, um, it's just the other side of the coin from this approach. And despite the fact that they're seen as often as opposites. Um, Bilbao, uh, by Frank Gehry, of course. If ZKM allied itself with the age of digital media by fusion, Frank Gehry's work allied itself in other ways. Foremost is the use of the computer to generate form. Just as mechanical drawings replace drawings by hand, 
Gary's use of sophisticated software brings the tools and the product into sync. The seamless fluid architectural forms thus mimic the characteristics of its means of production. However, of all the commentary on the Bilbao phenomenon that I've heard, the most insightful for me is the observation that its immense popularity derives from Gary's skill at making architecture appear to perform, in essence, to make it dance in ways that Le Corbusier could never have imagined. And I think in this case, I'd often, in the broadest sense, I would have to include ZKM also. Uh, I think that these projects represent, as I said, two sides of a coin, uh, but it is a whole new phenomena for architecture. And if you remember that footer from the New York Times where art and architecture seem to be the odd man out in a world of culture that is constantly performing or acting or, or unfolding over time, both ZKM and Bilbao, despite their formal differences, firmly move architecture into the realm of performance. Now, before continuing with the, the last example, I, I want to talk a little bit more about how I think these projects are related rather than, than different. In the last few years, these two kinds of architecture have been represented as a kind of oppositional, architect, uh, oppositional argument, the so-called box on one hand and the so-called blob on the other. The extreme formalism of this argument does not hold up under any real analysis, nor is this box and blob polemic anything new. In fact, as long ago as the Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci theorized that there were two kinds of form. The first, he said, was uh, without shape or any distinct or definite extremities. The second, he said, was a kind of visible body in that of which the surface defines and distinguishes the shape. And he gives uh, two different examples to illustrate what he was saying. Uh, he offered the cloud as a kind of a, a form without shape or distinct or definite extremities. And he offered architecture as an example of a visible body uh, with defined surfaces and dis that distinguish its shape. Um, in 65, 1965, Karl Popper, a philosopher of science, gave a lecture at Washington University entitled Of Clocks and Clouds, which many people see as a prefiguration of a much later discussion regarding the mechanical and digital worlds. In that lecture, he theorized that the cloud, Leonardo's first type of form, and the clock, the mechanical object, were not so different in that the cloud could be understood to be made up of hundreds of thousands of little clocks. In other words, the difference between a box and a blob is not inherent in their form, but it, is, it lies in our technical cap capabilities for analyzing the way they work. If the formal distinctions between these two types of architecture are not as important as they are represented to be, there is an important distinction to be seen in the way the OMA project and the Gary project have approached the whole issue of architecture and the media, and digital media, I should say. In many ways, the OMA project is, under, is architecture as the architecture of the computer is understood, support, hardware, platform. Most people who have ever opened the magic box of their computer are surprised to see that it looks like, it looks little like what comes out on the screen. And uh, it, in fact, of course, looks more like this microchip, orderly, uh, in fact, architectural, architectural. Indeed, the chip is one of the little clocks that make up Leonardo's clouds without shape or any distinct or definite extremities. Bilbao, on the other hand, looks less like what's in the computer and more like what comes out of it, output as opposed to platform. In this case, his mastery of software is in the service of producing the clouds, not revealing the clocks. If boxes and blobs are less distinct than has been theorized, and this is the fourth example I would give, I would say there are three examples. The middle two are opposite sides of the same coin, in a sense, as far as relationship to media. Um, now, if um, a fourth type of building that I, I would call a product of this new uh, digital culture is what might be called real architecture, uh, for lack of a better term. But like um, so many other things, uh, well, here's another uh, part of the theorem of the media, Riley's theorem of the media. New media, rather than replace old media, actually redefine them. So in a certain sense, real architecture is uh, a certain kind of architecture that's been redefined uh, 
for, by the emergence of new, um, new architectures. This is Peter Zumthor's spa at Valls in Switzerland. Um, the conceptualization of virtual space and uh, all of its uh, manifestations in the late 20th century, um, you know, flight simulation, video games, computer modeling, et cetera, forced architects to retroactively conceptualize quote unquote real space, certainly something with a somewhat awkward construction to it. I suppose you could also say non-performative if you're talking about new media redefining old media. And um, I would say that real architecture or non-performative architecture is not necessarily traditional architecture, although it's often described as conservative or traditional. But I would say it's more appropriately called an architecture that expresses a newfound and intense material sensuality. Um, in this particular spa, you descend into the earth, all the walls are made up of these granite bricks. There are three pools, uh, tepidarium, caldarium, and frigidarium to recall the Roman baths. You go into another bath and the water's very warm and it's full of uh, mountain flowers and you get this incredible smell. There's another chamber that you have to swim into from under the water. You arrive and it's a, a sealed chamber and it has this amazing kind of acoustic properties, et cetera. In other words, it's a whole series of strategies to make you aware of the unique experience of architecture as a transmitter of sensory messages. And in this sense, I would see it as a reaction to the emergence of a virtual, virtual world. Uh, real architecture can be seen as a compensation for the loss of the body, a corrective for an overstimulated world. It is intentionally and definitively outside the digital world, but I would argue was no less created by it. Now, if you go back to this chart, I think the one thing that you might note, as opposed to the other ones, that this one appears slightly to be going up. And I'd just like to talk about that in closing. Um, despite what might be considered a, a, a continuous decline in the quote unquote market share, to use the terrible term, and uh, despite the period of uh, architecture's withdrawal, shall we say, from the zeitgeist, its moment of autonomous reflection. Uh, I would say that the overall trajectory of, of, of architecture today, as within the world of media, um, is, is, is probably better and more healthy than it has been in, in quite some time. Um, following Frodo's erroneous prediction that this will kill that, Nietzsche famously observed, that which does not kill you only makes you stronger. Thus, having been diminished uh, fairly seriously for and redefined uh, over the past century, architecture may indeed be better for it. And the, the first question most people ask after I finish is, well, how is that possible? And you know, uh, one of the great things that does come from uh, the architecture of the 70s, you know, this autonomous moment, is once uh, architecture is unhooked from this notion of being the work of nations and the alphabet of kings, architecture for the first time actually has the possibility of uh, maintaining a critical attitude towards culture. Um, uh, Schinkel did not have the opportunity to be critical of the Prussian monarch. It was not allowed him. Yes, he was allowed to create the, 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 say, the setting for which the pageant of the nation took place, but architects uh, were denied the, the role, and this was a role they actually invented for themselves, of actually maintaining a critical uh, practice. And, uh, and I think this is the most important thing uh, to have happened to architecture in, in, uh, in many, many years. Um, I think it is foolish to think of architecture reemerging as, once again, the alphabet of kings. But in recognizing the opportunities and limitation presented by a mediated world, architecture has found its voice within the overall course of contemporary culture in what might be considered compelling and authentic ways. Thank you very much. Thanks, Terry, for this, uh, as you put it, intuitional sort uh, of. 
uh, lines of thoughts. I, I think uh, uh, you really did set up uh, a very nice, nice uh, sort of table for debate. So I may 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 start. I mean, would you say, uh, with the, with the with the kind of concluding remarks, that when architecture goes more, when it is liberated, you know, to to express national identities, big powers, and it's becoming more somehow merged with media, that it is uh, somehow. Uh, gaining a possibility to, bom to be more critical. Could, could you, I mean, to, to be more critical, to, to, to kind of critically, as you say, uh, build a critical attitude towards the power, mm. towards the politics, uh, towards the superpowers, and be more critical in the production of the culture? Yeah, I think the, the opportunity certainly exists. I think um, Peter Eisman is a classic example of an architect or Daniel Liebskin, uh, I'm thinking of his Berlin Museum, um, the whole notion that the architect would be given liberty to actually construct a rather painful, provocative uh, memorial uh, that uh, uh, nothing but a built uh, indictment of a certain historical moment is actually a, a, a totally different uh, phenomena in the history of architecture. It's just not what architects were um, called upon to do before. Um, the notion that architecture has any, now good or bad, in this particular instance, the, ocean, the notion that architecture is a form of personal expression. This too is a, re, you know, a product of this notion of a, a period of reflection and, and autonomous uh, existence in a certain sense. Right. Is that a? No, yeah, yeah, no, it is. But then, then let's go just a little to, to our next speaker, Dejan Sujic, mm -hmm. and his article about obviously Daniel Libeskin's submission to this you know, World Trade Center competition, where he would argue the opposite, that maybe these particular architects kind of submit themselves to the, you know, some sort of uh, economic powers. Would you agree with that? I, I'd have to say that the World Trade Center competition is a kind of fantasy that uh, mm -hmm. a recovery of the alphabet of kings, work of nations, uh, mm. a pyramid building sort of thing. and. Um, I have to say that I've completely changed my views about this. I thought they should have a competition, they should let pick an architect, they should build the scheme. And um, I realized that in the contemporary city, you know, Schinkel or Hausmann in their own time could have, uh, in a time where uh, society was much more regulated and con conforming, could indeed remake huge sections of the city and, and it could be quite mm. successful. Mm. Uh, the 21st century is not a time where you give one architect a whole quadrant of the city and say, build the whole thing in your, in your vision. And uh, the project has kind of degenerated into uh, different architects building different buildings. And uh, I had to admit to myself after the whole Liebeskin thing played out that mm -hmm. that's actually the way you should build, building, build, build cities, mm -hmm. that, uh, that a building at a time is, is more intelligent. Right. But just to go then to your further, because you've been in the jury, right? The pre-jury. Pre-jury, right. Uh, but you've been definitely very, uh, very substantially taking part in the jury for the new MoMA, obviously. Yes. And, and, uh, and then one would maybe uh, say that uh, the, the MoMA final choice uh, to go for Tanaguchi uh, 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 kind of shall we say, more traditional than, than, than more avant-garde architects, mm -hmm. which you line up in, in that incredible competition. How, how you look to this decision, I mean, culturally, politically, and architecturally, mm -hmm. uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the final sort of building which you, mm -hmm. you, you achieved? Mm -hmm. um, the, um, I mean, I, on some levels, I think there was a, a bit of a misunderstanding, or at least a lack of communication between some media representative, shall we say, and the museum about what the museum was trying to do. The museum was actually trying to radically address its own practices. And um, I know that, and you know, I'm principally interested in architecture, but I, after 12 years, I have been drawn into a lot of these discussions about the, the world of art and how MoMA uh, for 40 years presented the history of modern art as a single line, uh, absolute narrative, how uh, MoMA 
believed in totally uh, white out of spaces with no windows out to the city so that the, there was no distraction, et cetera, et cetera. And um, what was pretty evident as we started this project is that those issues were much more important uh, in terms of who the people who were making the decisions. They felt that the purpose of the museum was about the history of modern art and that to drastically change the way that history was told was actually the most important thing to do. Now, I think a lot of people wanted to see the selection of the, of the architect as a kind of international um, statement about what the future of architecture should be. Mm. But you know, I actually think that the um, two things there. Um, the time when the museum or anyone could claim that there's one way to proceed across the globe, mm. it's just, it's over and it's, it's, it's not worth discussing. So uh, what some people were seeing as a very kind of international platform uh, was often seen as a response to very important institutional and, and local issues. And in fact, the architect said he thought of it more as urban planning in a certain sense than um, the architecture in the beginning, his first scheme. And uh, I don't think MoMA is a, it's, I don't think we laid out a uh, template to be imitated everywhere. I think uh, MoMA's appropriation of a certain kind of modern architectural language, given its history, uh, I think is actually uh, quite understandable. Uh, whether a new institution with no history and a focus on contemporary culture should do that, I would say that that doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. But uh, this is my final, uh, and it goes a little bit to, to what you are describing, saying that there is no sense to believe anymore in a kind of uh, introduction of canonical behaviors through the, the powers, through the centers. Do you see in, in a future that uh, a kind of cultural directions or trends or, you know, uh, the paradigmatic breaks would be embraced with some uh, museums in Shanghai or in Lithuania or in Mexico, or still we will be kind of, you know, uh, looking to New York, Paris, and this kind of, shall we say, old center of powers. Mm -hmm. um, well, museums are so uh, radically different, each one, and um, I, I uh, will put it this way. I just, I was in Hong Kong for discussions uh, about a new cultural center in West Kowloon, and it's, um, it's being run by developers. I don't know if you know about this project, mm. but it's this beautiful site in West Kowloon facing the bay. The government is going to give it to whichever developer bids the highest. Uh, what the developers have to do is build four museums and run them for 30 years, and then they can, uh, once they've met those um, demands can do whatever else they want to on this site. Um, what the intention of the developers is, uh, despite what I said to them, is they're going to build these museums the way you would build a mall, and they're going to try to attract tenants. They're going to try to attract the Guggenheim or MoMA or, or uh, uh, the Pompidou to fill the space the way you would get Conrad's or um, what's a big department, Harrods or yeah. something like this. Or Gucci. Yeah. And um, I had to say I was, I was I'm one part sort of horrified uh, at this whole, I mean, this whole notion. I mean, it's, it's the franchise thing being taken to the extreme level. On the other hand, I said to myself, I probably shouldn't yeah. just simply dismiss it because there's, there's no template for this in this whole uh, area of fantastic growth. I mean, uh, museums are whatever anybody says they are. Mm. If, if Hong Kong says these are museums, then they're museums. There's no, mm. there's no official museum association to say that's not a museum. Yeah. That's, that's what it is. I mean, so I, I would expect from Las Vegas to the Louvre to, museums will be whatever they, they, they claim to be. Yeah. Okay, uh, your questions?
there is a there is some debate now that for, especially the the architecture like for instance uh, foreign office and some other people which make this kind of continue flow buildings or with a bad name they are called the people who make the blobs that the, a lot of them focused on that architecture is about presence it's not about meaning it's not about iconography but it's a kind of performance of the senses in, in a kind of new manner what i sense in your lecture which i like is that you don't make this difference between presence in opposition to representation uh, so my question to you would be is there in representation, so on the, the level of, of iconography and meaning in architecture, do you believe that there is also a more critical assessment within the idea of representation mm. instead of diving only to presence? Well, I think that it's, to me, it's rather evident that meaning in architecture has shifted from form to surfaces. That um, I find it almost, I mean, I find it very uninteresting to look at a building and uh, define it by describing its shape. Uh, I just, I think that whole way of categorizing is, is um, I, I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, the head of the Pompidou uh, was in New York and I gave her a tour of the new Taniguchi building, which, you know, in this spectrum of I can, what I would consider contemporary architecture, I will admit Taniguchi is more conservative than many other options. Um, she was quite excited by the big public spaces, and I asked her what she thought, and she said, it's so great, it reminds me of the Pompidou, or it reminds me of Bilbao. Now, this was the last, and I, this is only tangentially answering your question, but it's the last comparison I really expected. I asked her, what did she mean? And she said, the scale, the light, the bridges, the sound of the space. And I realized here was a woman who was lucky she was not trained as an architect because she saw and felt the presence herself in the space the way she felt it in Bilbao without having to categorize either experience by whether the lines were, were wiggly or, or uh, square. And I thought that that sort of awareness of the effects of architecture was much more sophisticated than I sometimes engage in myself. That tangentially answers your question, I think. Any further? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, f I didn't see anything about sort of um, architecture that, in a sense, responds to stimuli um, using media technologies, um, like a Frankenstein or a marionette, say, a Osterhaus um, type building. And I was wondering, is, is, is there a schism now uh, being created in architecture between the, the zoom tours and the, these real-time uh, moving buildings? Or is that architecture? Where do you classify that? Well, no, I think the most important part of the question is, is there a schism? And I. Um, I think those who would like to believe there is a schism between these various approaches to contemporary architecture are trying to revive and maintain a kind of 20th century polemical position. I mean, I don't know why I love Toyo Ito's media. I like all these projects, and I don't find that uh, I have to dislike one to like the other one, although I, I find that they have very... Uh, the, their roots are somewhat close in terms of where they spring from. They are, of course, very different. And the, the notion that you, if you like one, you have to hate the other one, I think, is, is uh, uh, giving form uh, too much meaning. You know, it, it, and I, I don't think it, it, it has it. And it's, um, it's not quite as absurd as, well, I don't know, I shouldn't say absurd, but I mean this notion of working in a, a modern high-rise, getting in your car and going home to your pseudo-English Tudor Cottage. Um, I think there was a moment of high polemics where uh, this was considered a kind of outrage. Um, but I, I, I think the basis for this kind of um, uh, uh, polemic, especially as it applies to form, this is this blob versus blob 
Box versus Blob polemic, I think that there's just there's not an ideological basis for, for this pseudo confrontation. But I mean, they're they're quite similar though, and I mean, they they both have something. One is very um, strong and and formal and rigid, and wh whereas the other one is is very dynamic. And I think that both um, possibly because of this oversaturation in um, in media that we that we that are, we are surrounded by, they both attempt to somehow grapple the, the senses and, and. And who's they both? Well, I'm I'm using Zumthor and and uh, Osterhuis as two. Uh huh. Yeah. Not poles, yeah. but I think they're no, very I, similar. I, I I would I would say that's correct. In other words, the form isn't actually in both. If if you're talking about the water project. No. Just this idea. I mean, if further. if you compare those two projects and say that, and realize that part of the rationale of those is that they both, both of them had an intention to make you intensely aware of your, your physical sensation. I think that's more important than the fact that one's rect rectilinear and one's, one's not. I mean, uh, photography, and this goes back to the lecture, photography has always preferred form. You know, you get to, to take a photograph, you have to get light on a subject. You get light on it, light casts shadows. Photography can't tell you what it's like to move through the building. It can't tell you what the acoustics are like. It can't tell you how you feel. It can only tell you what it looks like. And, and of course, architecture for I don't know how long has been taught with pictures. And so form constantly emerges as the defining characteristic of architecture. That's how you can tell if it's Gothic or Romanesque. And that's, you know, this sort of invades even contemporary discourse where the form doesn't even have the, the sanction of a, a kind of historical consistency. Um, earlier tonight, uh, during the interview, you mentioned that you noticed a trend or sort of a reemergence of uh, interest in the public realm. And I'm mm. wondering if uh, your position as this mediator, so to speak, do you see that this reemergence is happening within just the discourse itself, within the profession, the praxis, uh, the theory, or also within the public realm itself? Um, I think if you look at 100 years ago, uh, the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, and the what happens in the first decade, say, of the 20th century, um, the turn of the century happens with this kind of euphoria that is borders on almost hysteria and this anxiety about the future and are we doing the right thing and what is the future going to be and we have to get there to be the future 20th century and you fast forward 100 years the last three four years of the 20th century taking out for a moment the anxiety about y2k remember when that was what actually people were worried about um, and you examine the, again, euphoria. You know, the, and on top of this, it was the millennium, change of the century, change of the millennium, uh, coinciding with the emergence of new digital possibilities. And virtual reality was going to replace all sorts of uh, otherwise, quote unquote, real activities. Um, all sorts of amazingly euphoric predictions were made. What I find interesting is five years into, well, it's not so amazing. It's history repeats itself. If there was a kind of pendulum swing at the millennium, there's a kind of move back a bit. And um, one of the things that I, I can't help but notice when I look at magazines and journals and go to architects' offices is the astounding number of stadiums, theaters, concert halls being produced in every corner of the globe and not just by sports architects or uh, professional theater architects, but by every well-known architect. And I think that this sudden, and I, I, uh, I have to say it's, it's, it's relatively recent, but this sudden sort of interest in these kinds of buildings as civic monuments um, is a kind of, it's like sort of the revenge of the real world. I mean, um, as opposed to what we thought was going to happen, which was you were never going to go to a stadium again. You were not going to, you were going to experience all these things from your home or your shirt lapel would have the World Cup on it, uh, things like this. And there's this kind of, um, I think, renewed interest in, in being there, you know, in the kind of reality of, 
of events and, and space. Um, <clears throat> I actually have a question regarding this issue of criticality. Uh, you said that um, because of this autonomous period of architecture of people like Rossi and uh, Rational and the uh, realistic architecture of Aventuri and so on, that because of this sort of autonomous period of, of the Rossi part, um, architecture created a type of criticality which allowed it then to perform uh, in a kind of a distance to to what they were working in, in a kind of a distance to the system, so to speak. Now, my question is basically, don't you think that in some ways, um, or the question is, do you think that this criticality is still here and is still possible, or is it not like, uh, somehow like that uh, uh, precisely um, projects like Guggenheim or projects like even like CCTV and so on actually work with the system in that they are both conforming to the interests of the system, so to speak, and also are conforming to the mediatic apparatus of the system, being, meaning they are easily photographed, they look good on photographs, they can be circulated in architectural magazines and so on. And then the question would be, is not the fact that this curve goes up in the end a kind of an idea that uh, media did not kill architecture, but rather media put architecture on a kind of a life support, right? That, and the life support uh, uh, is basically possible because precisely the criticality that architecture had in the kind of in the trough of your diagram disappeared. Mm. That's a that's an excellent, that's a really good question. And, and there's a couple responses. I won't call it a uh, complete answer. I mean, it, there is a, the, the one of the effects of Bilbao um, that is both good and bad. And I just did a kind of tour of Spain, looking at a lot of architecture in, in, in many different cities. And, and the, good, uh, the good part of Bilbao was that it legitimized all sorts of architecture. And uh, buildings that I, I truly believe would never have been allowed, not that they're as, say, radical or as large or as transformative as, as the Guggenheim in Bilbao, but buildings that just simply would not have been allowed in the city centers are astoundingly appearing in everything from uh, rather small towns to, to very large towns. Um, and uh, Bilbao created a kind of permission to do these things. That said, uh, and this weirdly ties back to um, um, MoMA and why it is the way it is vis-a-vis -vis the art that it has. So this is, I'm sorry to digress, but this is. So uh, a friend of mine who's a critic, Sylvia Kobowski, described what I was just saying about Bilbao architecturally. She described it from a, the position of an art critic. She said it's the space of infinite permissibility. Now, when you have infinite permission, when there is no borders or edge how does art look that is supposed to be pushing the edge? There is no edge. And if you think of uh, art, uh, artwork like Klaus Oldenburg, which was absolutely the essence of the work, or, or Damien Hirst, is a kind of uh, satire on the pieties of museum practices. Uh, big, floppy uh, lipsticks and, uh, and the like you know, lumped on a floor. Um, now, the Oldenburg soft shuttlecock is like a classic piece in this regard. I saw it in Venice in the Palazzo Correr uh, two Biennales ago, and it's this huge floppy shuttlecock, you know, normal everyday object, no allegory, no high-mindedness, inside this incredible neoclassic palazzo. And it, it had this incredible power this critical power. When you bring the same soft shuttlecock and put it in the atrium at Bilbao, it's not, that space is meant, it has no rules, there's nothing to break, there's no lines to cross, you know, and the question is how does art maintain its criticality when it's in a space that has no edge, it has no, uh, nothing to push against.
And so in a certain sense, there was an intention that in, in MoMA, if the art was to achieve its most critical dimension, it needed borders, edges, canons, if you will. And the architect's rationalism plays out as a metaphor for this. Uh, I had one other way of answering your question. Um, yes, Bilbao architecturally creates permission to do things, but in a similar way, and Peter Eisenman has talked about this endlessly, um, for an architect who conceives of himself as someone who is pushing the limits, and he goes into a presentation, and I don't know if any of you have seen the work in Galicia, in Santiago de Compostela. It's fantastic. I mean, when you walk on the site, it's just astounding. It's, um, it's 120,000 square meters. I mean, it's like enormous. And it's this, you know, rupturing split project. And uh, one gets the impression, and I think Peter has even admitted this, you know, you present this project, and the client is like, you know, make it bigger. You know, there's no, there's no pushing back and forth anymore. There isn't this critical rapport with the client. The client is convinced that anything and everything is possible. So there are many ways that that whole permission plays out, both positive and I think negative as well. Does that answer some of your questions? I mean, I could talk about China too, but it, it's, um, China baffles me in a certain sense uh, on this particular issue. Um, the whole idea that Western architects are being imported, um, producing work on a scale they've never done before uh, for a culture that I don't know that they, I mean, when you do a 100,000 seat stadium and you say it's based on bird's nest soup, I, I find that there's something terribly out of sync. Um, and it's not just vis-a-vis -vis the government structure, but I don't know how a 100,000 seat stadium can be a bird's nest. Uh, soup. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. It's like you go to a restaurant and you pick up a metaphor and do the design, go back to wherever you're from and do something else. Um, anybody else? Anybody, anybody else? Um, just maybe the last one. I mean, I don't care. No, I'm enjoying yeah. myself. I don't know if. No, no, it's more an anecdote, not. It was Peter Zumter actually showing Wals at the Berlach, quoting Heidegger and only showing the pictures of an Alain Binet, obviously black and white. Mm. A couple of weeks after at the MTV, it was Janet Jackson actually mm -hmm. was there about him, right? Uh, sort of swimming in, not entirely dressed, in uh, the same pool. A wardrobe failure? Another wardrobe failure? So what do you think? Well, this is, um, this what, is the what the gentleman was talking about, Mark was, about was. architecture on a life support system. Right. Um, I mean, I can't say I hate it that the media has now discovered architecture. Um, uh, one, I mean, I think a, a great example of what you're talking about is Wallpaper Magazine. And um, I remember reading an article about Lena Bobardi, or it was, maybe it was about Sao Paulo in general. And they had a pull quote. A pull quote is when they take one sentence and blow it up larger so when you're scanning the pages it, it reads. And uh, the pull quote was, it's not ugly, it's modern. <laughs> uh, with all these pictures of kind of brutalist concrete buildings. It's not ugly, it's modern. And you realize that this magazine has a huge readership of people who are approaching architecture precisely in the way that I was describing as, as being not very helpful. But um, I can't, at, at the same time, I can't say that the fact that people are interested is a bad thing. I mean, even in a superficial way. Um, that's probably the first step towards actually getting somewhere else. David Riley, thank you very thank much you. indeed. Thanks. Architecture uh, in the MoMA uh, Museum of Modern Art in uh, New York, and uh, starting with this interview, uh, uh, the first question I wanted to ask you uh, is very much related to the theme of, the, of this this year's lecture or this, this period's lecture, which is about mediation. And uh, first, to get your perspective on 
uh, what you thought first, you know, when you saw his uh, being uh, part of this list of names as uh, mediators, and uh, and how do you uh, uh, somehow participate in this commission mm. as a mediator? I think that would be the first question. Well, you know, I think of it. Um, I try not to think of it too much. <laughs> try not to be too self-conscious about it. But you know, I think of it as MoMA is sort of like a newspaper, and there's different reporters who write for it. And uh, so, uh, on one level, there is a kind of institutional mediation that's going on. MoMA, over the years, six to seventy-five years, um, has a kind of institutional perspective. It has certain traditions and. Uh, Consistency, really? Well, a certain consistency which is about creating the illusion, and I think it's always the illusion, but creating the illusion that the readers are in a kind of dialogue with the paper or the institution. And this is why, the reason why the New York Times or any newspaper develops certain structures, you know, first section, second section, third section, certain columns, certain sort of things, and it, it, it is towards the goal of creating this idea of a kind of dialogue, uh, creating the notion that the reader is familiar with the paper or the institution. And then within that, it isn't just an institution talking, though. Every, um, like a newspaper or a museum, insists that everything be signed. You know, uh, and therefore within the overall framework there is the possibility of different voices and that is true in news you know every article has a byline you know which reporter or which, where did this come from who said this mm -hmm. and part of that is to um, is a kind of notion of transparency so there is mediation going on but it isn't it, it, part of this dialogue is a bit it's evident who is talking who is saying what and it's also quite possible, especially when you get to an op-ed page, that different people can be saying opposite things. And that's that's understood that there's a variation in critical opinion, etc. But I think um, you know, <clears throat> as a mediation effort, um, the museum has been quite frank that from the beginning that what it is about is trying to separate excellence from mediocrity. Uh, that is a kind of, shall we say, elite process of mediation. Uh, the museum's not a school, it's not about educating, it's about trying to focus on what its various mediators see as worth looking at. So, in, in this case, you're, uh, you're saying that it's not about education. But uh, apart from that, you, it still has responsibility to the public because it's open to the public. Yeah, what I meant by, by education, though, in that instance, it's not basic education. Mm -hmm. It's not ABCs. Um, uh, in fact, the tradition at MoMA has always been to have as few texts as possible, so that at the very end, you know, there is a huge mediation process going on, but at the very end, people are allowed to think what they think. And there isn't like instructions about what you're supposed to think about this or that. And um, in that sense, the education is, it's, it becomes more equal almost. You know, the, the person that goes to the museum is allowed to retain their own opinions and approach it on the, the own level that, that they want to, uh, rather than this extremely didactic approach. So the, the, the role of, in, of the museum in that sense would be uh, the, the... Enlightened in a way? It's almost like a seminar, like a, a slightly higher level seminar. In other words, it is elite in a certain sense, but it's a self-selected elite. Mm -hmm. In other words, no one's not allowed, no one is forbidden to come in. Anybody that wants to come in may come in and engage in this it, a kind of dialogue in a certain sense. And that's the sense of the public, but apart from the, pe the, the, the people that is chosen by, that are chosen, so maybe that are chosen by the, the curators, uh, and you being the chief curator, also play this uh, sort of uh, pre-selection of this. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is the responsibility that you have with the public, of course? 
for the other responsibility of representing the profession mm -hmm. in, the, in the, probably the most famous institution of all the time in the world. Yeah, and I, you know, and um, uh, what I, in, in uh, most instances, try to do, yeah, I mean, it, it is a very important position. Some people are, are disagree a lot with what I do. Some people agree with what I do. Um, it's not, uh, people th talk about it in terms of power. Uh, it has no inherent power. It's not um, uh, presumed power. It's not like being, a, 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 I don't know how you say, um, there's no inherent power. The, um, it's potentially powerful if you're able to work through it in a way that is convincing to people. And by that I don't mean convincing uh, in the sense of making everyone agree with you, but successful in using the mechanism of the museum to engage a broad public in a kind of debate. Um, I say dialogue, people say, well, how's it a dialogue? Where does the other side come from? And I think that uh, the dialogue actually comes because I take the audience, you know, in the most this abstract thing called the audience, very seriously. And uh, I uh, try to maintain as much of a connection to them as I do to the profession in terms of um, what projects are out there, who's doing what, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, I have been trying, I, I do try to understand who that audience is. Um, as best as I can, and it, what's different to say between the difference between MoMA as an institution and say the NAI mm -hmm. uh, is a kind of critical difference because NAI is an architecture institute, and I would probably imagine that about ninety percent of the people that go there are architects mm -hmm. or designers, and maybe ten percent are the sort of general public that is interested in architecture. Maybe it's a little higher. I'm not sure. But at MoMA, I know it's the exact opposite. It's 90% the general public. I mean, at an opening party, maybe it's reversed. But on a day-to-day -day basis, it's about 90% the general public and 10% professional. And when I say general public, I mean the kind of public that goes to a museum. So um, to be effective in mediating there, I mean, it's clearly who are you mediating to? Who are you mediating for? Who, who, what are you trying to represent is always a difficult question when it's architecture in a museum, but uh, who is the audience is critical because if you don't understand who they are, you don't understand what skills they have, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of understanding architecture, you don't understand what it is that they are looking for, you know, in architecture. And I happen to think that especially the general public that goes to museums is one, very intelligent and very curious, you know. And these are two, um, and very willing to act on, upon their curiosity and their um, interest. You know, they are people who will elect to use their free time to go to a museum as opposed to, say, a sports event or, or, or whatever else. And um, they're interested enough to go see architecture shows, to see painting and sculpture exhibitions to see video. So, in other words, they they really are a kind of uh, ideal audience uh, if you know how to talk to them. And so what becomes very difficult at the museum is trying to do exhibitions that appeal to pro the professional that has a very high level of interest, mm -hmm. and spe specifically to the subject, and also somehow um, not ignore this really important Segment and if, listen, if you can't, I feel if a curator can't create an exhibition that's interesting to this motivated, intelligent, and interested group, it's a huge uh, opportunity that's lost. Uh, now, what do you do when this one group can't even read a section? I mean, they don't know what a section is. You know, that you can't, you can't probably even explain it to them in the context of an exhibition. I mean, so, so there's this, this big gap that you have to kind of address. Uh, I hate to give really long answers, but this is a, an important topic. One thing that I have done uh, in most of my exhibitions to entice this 
majority into this um, into coming and uh, feeling like they can participate in these shows and encouraging the general public, so to speak, that they have a right to an opinion about architecture mm -hmm. is, um, I usually don't use the word architecture in the titles for the show. The end private house, like construction, tall buildings. I think the title is really approachable. And one reason I do that is I was surprised to hear from a publisher that they don't like to publish books with the word architecture in the title because the general public thinks it's a specialty. Now, this is a huge problem for architecture if this kind of motivated, intelligent, uh, interested person thinks architecture is a specialty, that they don't, you know. These are people who have ideas about film, favorite directors, painting, sculpture, you know, everything, but somehow have come to the point where they feel that they don't have the right to say, oh, I love, what, I love Renzo Piano, or I love Dan Liebeskin, or, or something like that. I don't like so-and-so. Uh, uh, and I, I don't think uh, you can really have architecture as part of a broader culture, cultural discourse unless non-architects feel they have a, a right to have an opinion. So this leads me to another question, and then it's... Uh, I'll give shorter answers. Yeah. <laughs> no, this could be also like an uh, answer, because we have to get into that raw subject of between us. But uh, it relates a lot on how did you, I mean, I'm sure this question has been asked to you a lot, how did you decide on the approaching or this, uh, on Joshua Tanabuchi's uh, building uh, as part of being a the image that the MoMA gives to the people, which is somehow clear that it's the less, uh, it's the most transparent, it's the most neutral, it's the most less architectonic proposal of, let's say, compared to Herzog's or Rams or Schumann's. Or well, actually, I wouldn't say it's the least tectonic. In fact, if you go, it's unbelievably I mean, tectonic. Mm -hmm. I, the, the, the building, the emphasis on building and techniques of building are um, extraordinarily subtle and almost unphotographable. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say to any architect who's sensitive, it's like an extraordinary lesson. And it was a lesson to me, too. This was not something I would have said in the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't, I wasn't quite aware of this. But uh, we picked 10 architects. I mean, you know, a lot of times they have these competitions and they, they stage them I, I feel in a, a, a kind of demolition derby mm -hmm. fashion. I don't know if you know what that term means. Mm -hmm. um, it's when you have 10 cars with armor and mm -hmm. a track and they keep running into each other and the last one standing wins. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so it's, this, it's this idea that you should have one postmodernist, one deconstruct this one this and one that and it becomes a battle of the styles and and it's the the idea is presumably that the best the most appropriate style will therefore win and the winner is therefore the most appropriate style um, I mean I I thought it was rather self-evident that after 75 years as MoMA and considering its role in developing a Propagating modern architecture, in, in uh, certainly in North America and, and even then in other parts of the world, uh, MoMA, unlike any other contemporary building project, MoMA had a unique interest in what might be considered uh, the ongoing uh, developments of modern architecture, mm -hmm. and we looked at ten architects from a rather on, on one end, a somewhat cons more conservative, but I would still say very contemporary expression, uh, and I would say Tanguchi was on that end, mm -hmm. to uh, more radical. And uh, we, when we decided, and <coughs> I was one of the few people in the beginning that wanted a competition, um, but uh, once we decided we, we did have one, you know, we agreed it's going to be a real competition. 
whoever does the scheme that works the best for MoMA is going to win. And honestly, I actually thought we would be in a slightly different territory. But I have to say that Taniguchi did the most intelligent scheme. I mean, he, he won the competition. Now, part of that is because I realized, and I love the building, so I can't be embarrassed about it, but I think part of the reason he won is because he was slightly more conservative. And, and what I mean by that is the nature of the project where you have five different um, uh, subsequent building programs. So you actually have a very kind of strange building that by the time we, we started this, uh, MoMA never owned, MoMA was not uh, uh, a building in a park where it could have a master plan and say that over the years we're going to expand yeah. like this. We're in Midtown. We, all of the adjoining property was owned by other people. So the only time we could ever expand is when some opportunity would come up and we would buy the building, tear it down, and we would grow that way. Well, after growing, you know, five different times opportunistically, in other words, without a, a master plan, it really became the, the, the problem this time around was to not only expand the museum, but to totally uh, reintegrate all those five uh, expansions and not be a wing, but to, 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 to transform it into a single coherent building. And um, what I realized afterwards is, you know, what most of the world was hoping we were doing was having competition to um, uh, identify the most, um, the, the single direction that all architecture should now be going in the future. What they didn't realize is that's not what we were doing. We, were, we had a very specific, and in some senses local, but no less ambitious. I mean, this was a very difficult thing to do. And as it turns out, I think it's probably true that an architect with a slightly more conservative attitude is probably going to, because what the program was really was, was about recuperation and uh, synthesis and, uh, um, shall we say, conservation in a certain sense of deciding what pieces to keep and what pieces to, to get rid of. That actually requires a certain kind of uh, attitude that uh, uh, has some kind of fundamental conservative basis. If you're, and, and this is all new, this is, represents a lot of thinking on my part that is new. Uh, I went to architecture school at a time where uh, it was good to be a radical architect and it was bad to be a conservative architect. If you're a good radical architect, you were listened to good radical music and wore good radical clothes and lived a radical life. And if you're conservative, you wore conservative clothes. And uh, in school, it really uh, was sort of um, constructed that it was actually possible to be a, a fundamentally radical or avant-garde sort of personality. And what, um, what I realized, especially during the course of this project, but what should have been evident all along is that, in fact, any architect who's building anything, there's, in the thousands of decisions that go into designing and building a building, some of them may actually be quite radical, some of those decisions, and other ones actually might be quite conservative. And it's actually totally okay for the architect to oscillate between modes for whatever will achieve their purpose. And I think that uh, Taniguchi's willingness to oscillate like that, and his lack of concern about whether this is a conservative move or that's a more radical move, I think actually is what gave him more subtlety and more options in dealing with the, the building. Like a, a, couple, a, a number of the, the people competing were just like the garden. Everybody, you know, it's the, the sculpture garden. 
Um, is it sentimental to say you really love it and you want to keep it exactly as it is and restore it? Uh, I think a lot of architects are actually afraid of expressing that kind of sentiment. Mm -hmm. You know, that it, it, yeah, it's really great. Let's keep it like it is. And um, so, what happened was, I think most of the architects were being really polemical. And Taniguchi was being, he said he didn't even think about it as architecture. He thought of it as urban planning. It was just, you know, put a street through here, treat it like a kind of village, and, and master plan it like urban planning. And he worked for Tange for 10 years, so you begin to realize that maybe at the root of the, his thinking it's a more urbanistic approach, you know, that precedes it ever being architecture. Uh, yeah, I have a question about, um, well, it's interesting that you were relating the, or making the analogy between a, a museum and a newspaper or publication. Um, I'm interested to know about how you feel about the role of publication work uh, following exhibitions uh, in kind of this age of uh, everything is published and mm -hmm. everything is consumed through publishing. Yeah. Do you find that there is a growing importance of publication over that of an exhibition, or is there, I mean to be polemic, is there even a need for exhibition anymore if we can just instead consume and read and understand through publication? All of those things actually fold in to make a kind of richer experience mm -hmm. of the study, if you will, of architecture. Uh, in the unprivate house, there were old-fashioned models. You know, and I call them old-fashioned, meaning built by hand, 3D sort of things. There was a lot of digital um, interactive uh, stuff. I don't know if either of you saw that show. I saw him in, in the catalog. <laughs> but I mean, one thing that was in the catalog was um, we wanted to transform interactive media in the gallery. And the one thing I hated about, well, let me answer first, why have the exhibition? The exhibition is, it's sort of like, why have movie theaters when you can see the movie at home? Mm. Um, this, is a, this is a phenomenon that uh, is hard to explain, but people like to do things together. Um, people go to a, an exhibition together. It's not, you can't say they've had the exact same experience, but they have had a very similar experience. and. Part of the experience then becomes talking about it, and um, it's why you see after a movie gets out, people lingering under the marquee outside talking about it, and it almost becomes as important to uh, 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 talk about it as, and, and the talking about it changes your experience, and um, I think it is true that whenever anything really important happens, people want to try to express it somehow or talk about it. The book is not the same, but it actually um, exists over time in a, in a way that, uh, you know, it's funny, books were supposed to be obsolete because of, <laughs> but you know what, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know that if I need to find some information on the web, I can find it, but it's never as easy as you think it should be, mm -hmm. and the fact is books remain at hand. They remain, uh, help you organize the way you think, and they, uh, they became, become resources. And um, I've always thought of those books, like Life Construction and The Unprivate House, as kind of resources, you know, as a kind of case studies. Um, and uh, I think they have a, a value like that. The one thing that, that, uh, that doesn't come through very well in exhibitions or books is things uh, or what I should say is multimedia allows you to take all the information that's sort of statically arrayed in an exhibition and then kind of re yeah. reprocess it according to the way the, the, the viewer wants to do it. And so um, we recognize the value of the interactive stuff. What I didn't like was the way it was used mainly in museums is uh, you know, these little boxes and you go and you you know move your mouse and you look at the screen and instead of being in the public space of a gallery all of a sudden you're in private space again mm -hmm. you know and it's not part of that shared experience, experience. Mm -hmm. so I worked with Neil Gershenfeld at the MIT Media Lab and I said we have to 
come up with a new way of delivering this information mm -hmm. in, a, in a public way. And so um, we came up with a metaphor, and because it was about domestic space, we were using um, residential furniture instead of museum furniture. In other words, we brought in beds and tables and chairs and we put the models on, on those kinds of furniture instead of pedestals and plinths and all that sort of thing. So we came up with the idea for the, the interactive aspect would be a dining table. Mm -hmm. And it would, be, it would be like this. In other words, everybody has their place, but everybody's together also. Mm -hmm. And um, what we did was, it was such an amazing thing, um, it was a Corian top, it was a plastic top, and then embedded in the surface from below were little were sensors that uh, reacted to the electric charge in your finger. Mm -hmm. So um, when you would sit down, there was a place setting, and there was, uh, I don't know what you call it in Dutch, but a lazy Susan, mm -hmm. you know what a lazy Susan is? That, yeah. Yeah. You turn yeah. it, and on the lazy Susan were 25 uh, coasters, we call them, and each one with a picture of one of the projects in the show. Okay. So you take the coaster and you put it where your glass is supposed to be on your place setting, and there's a chip in there, and the table recognizes the chip, and it activated a computer which projected a screen <laughs> onto the table. So there was no uh, computer, this is, this it was on the table, and I could see what you were looking at, you could see what I was looking at, and by pressing the buttons, you could actually manipulate the information that was coming down. We actually had video, streaming video. And if you had something you really liked, you could push another button and it would go in the middle of the table so everyone mm -hmm. could see it. So it became an experience. An experience. Mm -hmm. It became a shared experience. And people would come and stand behind and look. And for some reason, it didn't bother people. Whereas I think if you're in your little box mm -hmm. and there's people behind you, you feel a little bit... Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, under surveillance or something like that. So it was it was a really great thing, but it also demonstrates um, there's no all the new media make it easier. No, no I'm going to talk about this later this evening. No new media replace old media. They just make the, the whole thing richer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so in 2005, five years after the millennium, you know, it's kind of interesting to see that there's a kind of comeback for public space. There's a kind of comeback for analog and bricks and mortar in a certain sense. And the kind of euphoria about the digital future is uh, settling down a little bit to the point where um, I think uh, what uh, Italo Calvino said uh, begins to make a lot more sense. He said that heavy machines still exist, but now they obey the orders of weightless bits. So in other words, the computer revolution isn't going to wipe away mm -hmm. everything that preceded it. It's just going to infiltrate everything. And um, uh, we're beginning, if you look around, you see how many auditoriums, stadiums, theaters are being built everywhere. People yeah, you know, this want to experience so this, uh, this uh, supposedly old-fashioned idea of <laughs> yeah, you mentioned before this uh, that you tend to go to this um, how to um, how to make the institution closer to a wider public, but the institution also has the role within the let's say architectural pro profession. I mean, there there's been, there have been certain events throughout the history uh, really important for architecture, like kind of a breaks. So what's the a kind of progressive role of institution? Well, um, like I said, I, the, t the hardest part is to do these exhibitions where the professional feels completely uh, engaged, and as does the non-professional. And so it's actually usually designing two exhibitions at the same time. I mean... It's kind of a compromising or... It, if you do it really well, it doesn't have to be compromised, you know, I think. I think uh, if it's not done well, it probably does come along as a compromise. I mean, the one area that uh, I would say that, you know, if I was going to be self-critical, uh, I tend to prefer 
exhibitions where most of the projects are built. Okay, so obviously this means tends to be less emphasis on theory per se, and although I, I don't think theory ends where building begins. In fact, the only good architecture I, I believe is architecture that is both spatial and built and carries through the, the meaning, the theoretical basis. And the reason I, I say that, and I, and I think to, to some people, to some academics, they would see this as a compromise, but um, I, I think that the, um, the general public, even the interested general public, is a bit skeptical. And if, say, half of the projects in an exhibition are built, or are going to be built, it addresses the skepticism directly. And it's hard for them to say, oh, this is crazy, when it exists and it's actual. You know, I think this is what Gary did in Bilbao. He legitimized all sorts of non-traditional approaches to architecture just by simply having it exist. And so a lot of architects who tend not to be interested in building find that my exhibitions are, are not mediated enough that they're too fact-based or something like that. But I, I don't think in the context um, of a general art museum that that's a bad thing. Um, the other thing is, you know, we talked about books, exhibitions, multimedia. It isn't unusual, I think it's a good idea, that around the exhibition there be some sort of event, like a symposium, uh, a series of lectures or something. And this gives a chance for for a debate. For a more, at a, a totally different level. And in fact, you know, if the general public finds these things completely mysterious, that's okay. I mean, there's some kind of aspect that uh, at a certain point you should say, listen, we, we just want to talk on a certain level, and we don't want to be constrained by uh, concerns about broadening the discussion. But, and, and that's fine. That's a, it's legitimate, and I usually try to do it with Columbia or with Yale, um, just because they have an apparatus that uh, comes together very easily for this kind of event. Mm -hmm. well, it's um, almost uh, time actually, uh, but um, I want to finish up with some sort of a commentary on your part uh, that's regarded in much uh, uh, the feeling that we all have of, of your power as as being. Creator of at least uh, those points that were referring that sometimes people think, or probably was true, that somehow you launch into starting with bread colas or people like that. But uh, I mean, your position as a powerful man to decide these mm. things, and your position within the star system, mm. and uh, Robbie's pressuring us, so we have five minutes. Okay. Uh, so if I know it's, uh, I wanted to leave this last mm. question for you. Mm. Well, um, I mean, I, how do curators um, rate themselves? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think that uh, in a certain sense, uh, nobody, no architect becomes famous simply because they have an ex exhibition. Mm -hmm. if, if they're not good, if they're not, uh, I mean, th there are plainly, limits to this notion of power. Mm -hmm. Philip Johnson in the first exhibition, no, the second exhibition he did. No, no, sorry, the first one, the International Style Show at MoMA, featured nine architects who, by and large, well, Frank Lloyd Wright would have been familiar to Americans, mm -hmm. maybe Richard Neutra a little bit, Hal in the Skies also a little bit, you know, uh, but Gropius, Nice, Le Corbusier, Oud, and were completely new. Um, Raymond Hood, you know who he is? The uh, Rock Pro Center, I was thinking. Do you know who the Bowman Brothers are? No, I'm sorry, I'm not that. Bowman Brothers were these two young architects from Chicago. And Philip had seen 
some of their projects in some magazines. And he was under the impression that they had actually built a lot of stuff. Mm. And they hadn't built anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, if he had found out earlier, he probably would have cut them out of the show. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they were into metal construction, you know, and they were like, they were good. They were really good. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, well, I shouldn't say they were really good. They were pretty good. And, and the fact is that they were in the show with Mies and Cora and Wright. It didn't really help them because they weren't that good. So. I can't claim that I made anyone because if they weren't good enough, they, it, it, it doesn't matter. But I am rather proud that um, in terms of the first exhibitions in the U.S., I can't say it was Rampolas. We had an exhibition a really long time ago. But uh, Sejima, uh, Ben Van Berkel, uh, Jacques Cartson and Pierre de Miron, first exhibition they ever had in the U.S. Uh, and I could go on. And uh, that doesn't mean anything other than, I, I wouldn't say that means, look how powerful Terry is, he made these people all famous. Mm. I take it more as a compliment to myself in the sense of, I'd say, I had a pretty good eye, that was good. I <laughs> saw that and I <laughs> I believe that was good. You know, when I put Jacques and Pierre in light construction, the biggest thing that they had built was the Getz Pavilion. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that project, but it's, it was one, I mean, it was, it was you know, about four times as big as this room. That was the biggest thing they'd ever built. It was before the tape, it was before... The and tower, if, the light tower. If, if you look at... Uh, I mean, it's, it's really incredible what they've done in, in, in that amount of time. So that... Um, I mean, that's... It's, it's, it's not very interesting, in my mind, to spend your life trying to gain and retain power. Mm -hmm. I mean, for one thing, we all know it doesn't work, I and mean, eventually you die. You know, <laughs> you, you, you know. And um, I actually don't think if you're concerned about power, you can actually do anything truly very interesting, because I think that anxiety about power restricts mm -hmm. your latitude, and um, you'll never take, in a certain sense, real risks if you're ultimately only concerned about. You know, Am I right? Am, mm -hmm. You know, is this power? Is, does this make me more or less powerful? And um, so, uh, I actually think to be successful, you have to be rather vulnerable rather than very powerful. The only power I need is that when I call people, they return my phone call. <laughs> <laughs> if I say I really need some pictures, that they actually send some. That's and believe me, that's a lot. Of, you need a lot of power. It, in today's world, just to get somebody on the telephone and get them to, to, uh, to you know, send you the images with the right resolution, with the copyright taken care of. I mean, it's amazing how much energy goes into the most banal of, of efforts. Anything else? No, it's, uh, it's your time. It's really five minutes more. It's great. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Thank you.